I mean, we're recording. <laughs> now we're recording. Hi. Before we got into the devotionals, I wanted to introduce you to someone. I wanted you to meet my. Oh, you can't see it without being on live screen. Hmm. Well, this guy over here, this is my executive producer, and this is my director. And whenever things go wrong, he gets a little upset. Imagine waking up to that in the morning. But the reason why I bring that up is because, you see, if you don't have a sense of humor, if you can't stare this guy in the eye and see a resemblance between me and him, maybe you're taking life a little too seriously. That's the way I feel about Christians in general. 90% of the time, I don't think they know what they're doing. And the 10%, when they think they know what they're doing, God only knows what they're doing. So somewhere in between the time, I think we need devotionals, you know, because the rest of the time, kind of remind me of my producer and my executive director. Or was that the other way around? I'll tell you, I got to deal with them every day. So I guess I have to deal with you too. And you know what's even weirder? You got to deal with me because you're going to be stuck with me for eternity. Eternity? How do you know you're saved? Because I got Jesus. <laughs> How does anybody know they're saved? They don't. <laughs> is it going to make? Let's be real, folks. Come on now. If you got Jesus, you're saved. You know, you're going to spend eternity with him in heaven and all that stuff. But if you're worried about it, you probably better be worried about it because something's wrong. You may have a wrong understanding of God your Father. You may have a wrong understanding of God his Son, you know, and you may have a wrong understanding of God the Holy Spirit, and you may have a completely wrong understanding of salvation. Because if you're worried about it, you know, it might be good to worry about whether you're going to go into rapture or not. You might not go, but other than that, I mean, you know, God's going to kind of like, you know, do what he's going to do. And since we're created, you know, it's kind of like an ant telling us uh, they don't like the fact that we're in their way. And frankly, you know, they're going to take over the world. And we look down at that ant and go, uh, raid. <laughs> so be real about your God. Come on now. If your God's tiny and he's only subject to the Bible and he, he can't move the mountain and he can't move the Bible, you know, he can't do anything other than what he's already said he was going to do because he contradicted himself and that somehow he would prove himself not to be reliable and everything else. I think your theology is a little humanistic. I rather like the theistic, theistic interpretation of theology. See, the theistic theology goes something like this. In the beginning, God. After that, there is no after that. That's it. God. Whatever else he can do. Otherwise, no offense, but your theology about how God will only do according to what he promises and won't break his promises, won't do this, won't do that, and can't do this, and can't do that, and can't be, and can't exist, or whatever it is that you kind of come up with in theology, is philosophy. It's Christian philosophy disguised as theology. It really is. And as sad as it is for me to burst your bubble, theologian. I don't care if you're from Fuller, Fuller Dallas, wherever, Cambridge, <laughs> or whatever. You want to sit down and talk for five minutes? Great. Let's get real. If God is God and he's omnipotent, omniscient, and everything else that he is, then he can do what he wants and can do exist and do it and whatever. Blah, blah, blah. All of that. 
beyond anything that we could comprehend because after all we're limited and because there's limitation we can't understand the dissertation of what he would say anyway so how can we ever interpret or try to conceive of except through philosophical means the reality of God except that God is God and yes he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ and yes I agree with all the theology about it but it's still philosophy and the bottom line is God is and in the beginning God and that's it and in the beginning was the word and the word was with God the word was God so of course you understand that. No, you don't. <laughs> Let's get real. That is the most mystical thing you could ever imagine. What the heck is that? Some floating word going around? We interpret the best we can according to what we understand as God lowers himself and limits himself for our understanding up to a point. But you always have to remember that beyond this little, little tiny person that we are, right here, there's this big God up here that's so much bigger, as big as I am over this, because I can control it. Turn it on and off. The same is true with you. So, do I have an assurance of salvation? Sure. As much as assurances go. I have more of an assurance that God is God and I trust God to be in God. So because he's God, I trust God. <laughs> trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean on thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Other than that, who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? <laughs> Please. Oh, man. You got a serious theology problem if you got to go with, uh, we got the Ten Commandments and, you know, God said this and this, this. And, you know, he doesn't come to himself, so he's never going to do this and he's never going to act like this. And they're going to, hey. That's Jewish idea. You know, God already was put in a box, you know, and in Judaism, we had him nailed down to where, you know, he wasn't going to do this and couldn't do that. And that we had to interpret for him because after all, we hadn't heard from him in 400 years. And his Shekinah glory was not there when it came to being in the temple about the time of the Maccabees. So we had to invent a miracle in order to make it seem like the light had not left and that the anointing had come back or had it. Such a deal. Such a deal. We're rabbis, but God is gone. Can we tell the people God is gone? No. Okay, then what do we do? Hey, you got some oil? Shh. It'll only last for an hour. Oh, but it's the Ever Ready Buddy. Ever Ready Battery Bunny. He goes and takes a licking and keeps on ticking. So we're going to make a miracle. We're going to make God last longer. We'll make him last eight days. Seven days? Ah, what's seven? Hey, oi, we'll take some eight. You know, eight? No, six, twelve, fourteen, twenty-two, six, twenty, twenty-two. No, oh, well. Flip a coin. It's God's will. Heads, it is. Tails, it's not. Hey, the lot was cast. Okay, we got God's will. Is that true? Yes, it is, as a matter of fact. Because, you see, Judaism, when God's spirit had departed, invented miracles and Hanukkah is one of them celebrating a miracle that did not exist that did not happen but then sad to say oh we predicted it and we kind of go back and we kind of look for something to make it fit so messianic interpretation of it is but it's Yeshua uh, 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 oh. mm. let's see the menorah was seven, and it's patterned after heaven. So now we're going to say that the menorah is nine, but it's really eight because we don't count the shamash, which is really nine, but we're going to pretend like that's not part of the menorah because this new Hanukkah is actually a nine branch, but we're saying it's eight because the one is a servant, so we don't count the servants. We only count the anointed. So the only ones that are shining are eight, which really we have to leave the ninth one shining. So we go ahead and put eight up. So we go ahead and say, take the one and light the ones and put them up, you know, and then after all, that's a pattern that came up from heaven or from the rabbis i'm sorry but they were making up stories maybe christmas is like that maybe religion is like that maybe theology is like that maybe we could google it and find out the facts what a novel idea. Or we could ask God and trust in him and let him lead us today. Because 
if your theology again has gotten to such a theology theological humanistic perspective as opposed to a theistic directive you're going to keep saying what god can't do and i'm going to keep telling you oh yes he can because god is not a man stop god wants more than a minute see it says so right there i didn't make it up i count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Philippians 3.8 A thousand distractions would woo us away from the thoughts of God. But if we are wise, we will stay sternly put. A thousand distractions would woo us away from the thoughts of God. But if we are wise, we will sternly put them from us and make room for the king and take time to entertain him. In the internet as you can see over here I don't know yeah well you don't quite have it so let's go ahead and do this we can go ahead and like shift the picture over here and you see on the internet we have a thousand and one distractions as a matter of fact we call it informational overload a lot of times what happens to people is that as they are on the internet and as they're typing away and doing their thing you know you know moving the mouse around you know and checking out the pictures you know and seeing what's going on here you know and making like you know little likes and dislikes on Facebook and twittering and thumbing and doing all their thing they get bombarded by information and they get hit with it so much that they no longer have a connection to the words being said. They are reacting, reacting, reacting as fast as the screen is fluttering. See how it flutters? Flutter up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. If I do it right, if I could get speeded up, I could get it right with it, you know, and it looks like it's part of it, doesn't it? That's what your conversation is like when you have emotional attachment to the words that you've got an informational overload that you are saying things you don't realize you're saying doing things you don't realize you're doing and attaching emotions you don't realize that your soul is involving itself into so in the information age we've already identified this phenomenon by saying back away stop think about what you're doing I like to say say a prayer and leave it there but the point being is that distraction is causing you to be attracted to what's going on here as to what's going on here and what's going on here because you're focused on what's here see what i mean you may have oh i don't know some of these going on there you know and you may be involving your hair you know up there to hear what it is that you want to hear but if you don't filter as it were some of what's coming in you're going to be misled into things like oh hanukkah christmas you know recently the end of the world is this month yeah sure come on guys you know add the rest of the prophecies together and they don't add up so it couldn't have been so you get distracted by just what's right there in front of you just like if i turn this on whoever makes the loudest noise gets the most attention that's the problem don't be distracted God wants you to be attracted to him in such a way that you go I'll put the book down because it just said spend time with the king of kings I'll put the book down I'll put the TV off I'll put the children aside and I'll spend some quiet time with the Lord of Lords because he said so if Jesus Christ Jesus, the Son of Man. Jesus, isn't that personal? You're distracted. You're attracted by the religion and not the relationship. Because the relationship is a two-way street. And he's speaking to you today in a very, very personal way. In Tozer today, talking to you. Progress in the Christian life is exactly equal to the growing knowledge we gain of the triune God in personal experience. Quoting the Bible is only as good as God makes that quote real in your life. Yes, you do quote scriptures at times in order to influence, but trust me on this. Try Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and you will never live up to it. You will never do it. You will never be done with it. 
because Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Do you trust in the Lord? And I could spend five minutes with you and identify 10 things that you don't trust the Lord in, period. And what did he say? With all your heart. I can go through just an emotional checklist with you and you could tell me yourself just after looking at it. No, I don't trust him with all my heart. There are things I don't trust myself with all my heart. There are things I don't trust my husband, my wife, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my live-in relationship, my sexual partner, my friends with benefits, my milf, my gilf, my whatever it is, it's till toast or whatever the next thing's going to be. Your sin will find you out. Your separation from God will make it identifiable because you don't trust in the Lord. But God is saying to you this, do you want to know him? Do you want to love him? Then don't get a thousand scriptures. Don't get a million variations of the same word of God. Take one. And when God says it, if it's applicable to your life, live it. Live it. Make it real that you know how it fits. My wife has been studying Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 for five years now. Make that four. She'll shoot me. Make that six. Who do we appreciate? But she's been living that for a long time. And she knows now. I mean, she'll even quote it to me. Rarely, but once in a while she'll come up and say, no, I didn't trust in the Lord with all my heart in that area. I go, well, that, that explains it. So, okay, good. And then you could go on. Do you see? When you have made some part of the Bible as it is really living in you by way of personal experience, you are personally connected to it by experience in some way. It's not called the experiential theology, so don't get some theological idealism here that some theologian's going to come back and say, well, you know, we can't base our experience of the Word of God and the promises of God based upon experience because then we're saying that experience uh, trumps statement and fact is reality so we have to live up to the fact of it first rather than the experience of it second but if you don't have the experience of it somewhere in your chain of command you don't have command of it you just have pop and jay Ooh, i can quote it because i'm a visual recorder i can record whatever it is that comes my way i can repeat gossip i can tell you the stats from nfl football i know what my dream team is but can i express to you how I lived through Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Can I tell you how I trusted the Lord in it? And he came through. How it wasn't my understanding. Ask my wife about that one. God, one day when her son nearly died, God showed himself to my wife in a very personal, real way that she has a physical book with it written on it, the date, the time, and the experience that she went through with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and the fact that God is real, and she knows that. She has absolutely nothing can shake her from that fact that God spoke to her. She knows, bluntly, without, there's nothing that can ever, that will never be taken away from her. There's no explanation for it. Trust me. Ask her. I didn't do it to her. <laughs> I just think it's funny when I get to watch all these things happen to people. So. Experience isn't your guide. Experience is your application. You don't just take the word and repeat it. Well, I'm going to quote the word of God over you, brother. No, you live what the word says to you, not to someone else. And such experience requires a whole life devoted to it and plenty of time spent in the holy task of cultivating God in it of understanding it to its completeness, to its fullness, to its appreciation that it is your life's blood. That's what the Word of God is. That's why we read it. Yes, we have a Bible read that we do daily if you want to read it daily and then seven days without the Word makes one week and without the Word you do this, that, and the other thing. But if you don't experience it for the reality that it is, then you're going to be sitting there on that end of the video wondering what I'm talking about when I say God speaks to you verbally in a voice you can hear as you're hearing me. 
He might even call you on the phone, or he might call you on a video, or he might even talk to you on the internet. www.talktojesus.com. <laughs> God can be known satisfactorily only as we devote time to him. Without meaning to do it, we have written our serious fault into our book titles and gospel songs. A little talk with Jesus, we sing, and we call our books God's Minute, or something else as revealing about how little we care for God. The Christian who is satisfied to give God his minute and to have a little talk with Jesus is the same one who shows up at the evangelistic meetings weeping over his retarded spiritual growth and begging the evangelist to show him the way out of his difficulty because he doesn't know what to do and God is far from him and he doesn't know where God went but somehow God is no longer there and God's not on the throne and God can't do it and I don't even know if I'm saved. Spiritual retard. Bottom line. But why? Why? Did you take the time? Think about it. How fast are you trying to get off this video? Did you take the time? How fast do you go through your devotions? Did you take the time? Do you stop in your prayers to listen and see if God himself is going to speak after you have done shooting off your mouth to him? Do you? Blabber mouth? Listen. Take time. Experience him. Take the time. Hey, it doesn't happen in a day, a week, or a year sometimes. I spent a long time, sometimes even just holding my breath, stubborn. God, I'm not going to breathe again until you talk to me. Well, that didn't work too long. But something like that I've done. Oh, yeah. That's why I got a producer over here and a director. The Christian who is satisfied to give God his minute and to have a little talk with Jesus is the same one who shows up at the evangelistic service weeping over his retarded spiritual growth and begging the evangelist to show him the way out of his difficulty. Some things may be neglected with but little loss to the spiritual life, but to neglect communion with God is to hurt ourselves where we cannot afford it. If you are not having a personal dynamic relationship with God alone with him, then you are not having a dynamic personal relationship with God in a meeting with him. You are not. Get real. God is real. Jesus said, behold, look, open up, listen, be aware. I stand at the door and knock. I'm at your door, physical door, not the heart. If any man open the door, I will come in. Hey, expect it, expect it. Every Jew prepares on Shabbos a door for a uh, seating for Elijah to come in and sit down. And Jesus says, look, it's not Elijah, it's me. I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I'll come in and sup with him. He might even bring the father too. Have a chair set. I do. Have a place set. I do. Have an expectation. I do. It's not just about being snatched away into the clouds while you're doing your own thing. But what about right now? What about this moment? What about stopping this video and go to talk God with God? To go share with Jesus about Jesus. To go have a relationship with him. Even if you're just talking to a wall at first. They'll think I'm crazy. Maybe you are. Maybe this is all just craziness. But what better way to live? God will respond to our efforts to know him. The Bible tells us how. It is altogether a matter of how much determination we bring to that holy task. If you aren't willing to do it, don't pretend you're a Christian. If you aren't willing to be a fool for Christ, don't try to be a man of God for Christ. If you're not willing to just sit down and say, hey, you know what? I really don't hear God speak. I just kind of pretend like I do, you know, and it's kind of like, it kind of works out like a kismet kind of, you know, circumstantial sort of thing. And yes, I have to admit to you people, my God is circumstantial, but I'm willing to try. You see the difference? If you're willing, 
God will reveal himself more and more each day. If you're willing. If you'll start anywhere, he'll meet you there. But he'll take you farther. But will you take the time? Will you make the time? Do you have time for Jesus? Excuse me, I need to go talk with